So um, let's go back. So uh, one of the things that I enjoy watching are documentaries. Do I have any other nerds in the room? Any, any other documentary nerds? I love a good documentary, okay? Love it. And so a couple months ago, uh, Jennifer and I, were, uh, we were flipping through all of the streaming services trying to find something because it's like, how many times do you need to really watch The Office? You know, it's like, what, what can we watch? And so we, we stumbled across on Disney Plus um, a documentary on Apollo 11 and the moon landing, okay? Now, how many of y'all actually, if you... Go ahead and date yourself, right? How many of y'all remember the moon landing? Just raise your hand right there. Okay. How many of y'all, you only know of it from movies and stuff? Okay. How many of y'all feel like Jim Carrey and Dumb and Dumber? It's like, we landed on the moon? Um, so um, it, was a, it was a big thing. It was a big deal. Now, it's easy for us now, you know, with Elon Musk and all of his things and sending things into orbit all the time, but it's easy for us to forget that in the beginning of the space program, landing on the moon was not a guarantee. I mean, it was actually, it was very, very dangerous because even just two and a half years earlier, um, Apollo 1 had a fire start in the cockpit and it just burst into flames, killing all of the astronauts that were in the, the, uh, the, the spaceship there. So it was not a guarantee that we were actually going to make it. And so because it wasn't a guarantee, that meant that they had to have um, contingency plans in place for if something bad happened um, whenever the, the uh, spaceship was launched into space. So President Nixon at the time had a speech that was ready to go if something bad happened. And it was entitled this, In the Event of Moon Disaster. So if something bad happened, they would, you know, cut all the, the networks, so all, what, four of them, and, um, you know, so they would, they would cut all the network feeds, and President Nixon would go on TV, he would give this speech, then they would cut off all communications with the spaceship, and then a minister would come on and would commend all of their souls to the deep, and they would just go, well, they are gone. That's what they were prepared for. Now, spoiler alert, that's not what happened. Okay, if you don't know, all right, if you want to watch a documentary, then you can go watch it. But, but that's not what happened. It actually worked, you know. On July uh, 20th, 1969, with less than 30 seconds of fuel remaining, the lunar rover touched down in the Sea of Tranquility, and we landed on the moon, y'all. Okay, we landed on the moon. Neil Armstrong stepped out, and he gave those famous words, one small step for me man, one giant leap for mankind. And it was a great moment of celebration. A few days later, they returned. They crashed into the Pacific Ocean. They were welcomed by a, a big battleship, and they were honored as the heroes that they were. And they were able, at the end of it all, to utter the two, one, two of the best words in the English language. You know what that is? Mission accomplished. Don't you love those two words? Mission accomplished. Man, I love those words, mostly because I'm an achiever, okay? I like achieving things. I like getting things done. I make a to-do list just about every day. Any other to-do list people in the room, you love it? Okay, any of y'all sick like me and it's like, you know, one of the first things you do is like write to-do list on top of it so you can check it off. It's like, look what I did today, you know, I already did it, you know? And so I, I, I love it. I love getting stuff done. I, I like being successful. I like all of those things. It means a lot to me to accomplish things. It's one of the things, why, like one of the driving forces of my life is that whenever I finally get a chance to see Jesus, I want to hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to hear those words from his mouth. Well done. You want to know what that means? Turner, you got some stuff done good job. You achieved some things. You, were, you got junk done. Good. What does that mean? You were a good guy. You were faithful. You were moral. You did the right thing even whenever it was a hard thing. And you were faithful to me to the very end. I cannot wait to hear those words. That is driving my life. I want to hear Jesus say, Turner, mission accomplished. I want to hear it. I, I want to hear it because I love that idea 
of just the mission being accomplished. But at the same time, well, I know that that is something that can be achieved. There are other things to where in life to where we can never say mission accomplished. Because some things are just never done. You cut the grass yesterday, and you think, oh, I'm done cutting the grass. Oh, ho, 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 ho. No, you are not done cutting the grass because by Wednesday, it's going to start looking shaggy. And you're going to go, okay, now it's going to be time to cut the grass again. You do all of the laundry. You get everything out of the dirty clothes. You put it into the washing machine. You get it into the dryer. You get it all folded. You get it dispersed to all the right rooms. And you think, finally, self, I am done forever with laundry. And then your kid comes back home. Or your kid walks back in the door. Or they go take a shower and they leave seven wet towels on the bathroom floor. More laundry for you to do. You know, one of the things now, so uh, we are, we have kind of transitioned in our parenting. We don't parent little kids anymore. Uh, we've got, you know, we're talking 19 and 17. And so um, for some of y'all, I, I've got a bone to pick with you, okay? And this is my bone to pick with you. Um, I always thought that as your kids got older, parenting became easier. And some of y'all are dirty, rotten liars because you never told me the truth. You just let me believe that lie that it's just like, oh, it just gets easier as it goes along. And it does not. Parenting young adults is harder than parenting kids. And so I'm just waiting until my kids have kids and then it'll all be done for me, right? Okay, yeah, okay, exactly. You see, you dirty, rotten liars, you got to prepare me for these kind of things. So there are just some things in life that are just like are never going to be accomplished. They're never going to be done. They are ongoing things that will always be um, unending. And for us as a church, one of the things that we need to remember as a church is that our mission, we never get to say mission accomplished. This side of heaven. We never get to say mission accomplished. All the work is done. We, we don't have anything left to do. We can just sit around, be fat and happy, enjoy just each other's company, and just enjoy some nice Sundays together and just say, oh, okay, everything's done. No, 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 no. We don't get to say that. You've heard me say it before. I'll say it again. I'll say it until I'm blue in the face or until I'm dead. That as long as there is one person in Walton County who does not know Jesus as their Savior, our church is one person too small. It's just too small because they need to know who Jesus is. That is our mission, to tell as many people as we can about the saving grace that is available through Jesus Christ. We have a job to do. We don't get to go. We've completed the task. And so that's why today as we begin our, our new series, Witnesses, we're looking at this fact that that's who we've been called to be, Witnesses of Jesus Christ. Witnesses who are not satisfied with just a comfortable, you know, Sunday morning service, not satisfied with just a comfortable message, but we are actively placing our hope in Jesus, actively placing our hope in him and testifying to the work that he has done in our lives. And so for the next few weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking through um, the book of Acts in your New Testament, the book of Acts, and we're going to be doing it a little bit differently because what we're going to do is we're going to look at different witnesses in the book of Acts, people who had a story to tell in, and of what Jesus had done in them and through them. But today what I'm going to do is I'm going to call forth the very first witness and I'm actually going to call forth the star of the book of Acts. His name is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the star of the book of Acts. He is the central figure of this entire book. So if you've got a Bible, I'd invite you to find the book of Acts. It's in your New Testament. Um, you find the book of Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, okay, so it's, it's right there. Um, it is, um, it's on page 1,559 in my Bible, if that helps you at all, okay? So the book of Acts, let me give you a few Acts facts while you are looking this up. Um, the book of Acts is written by uh, 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 Luke, who wrote the Gospel of, come on now. Okay, good. You guys with me? All right, we're good, 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 good. All right, this is not high-level things today, all right? And so uh, the book of Acts is like Luke chapter, or part two. 
And so it's the story, you know, of what happened after Jesus ascended and went back to heaven, okay? If the book of Luke is the story of all that Jesus did on earth, then uh, the book of Acts is the story of all that happened through Jesus after he left earth. Okay, uh, it covers about 30 years of history or so, so it's not like a long period of time, but it is an important period of time because in just those 30 years, movement, a movement started that would literally change the world. And so Luke tells the story, this important story of the birth of the church and the things that Jesus' followers were going to do. And it's not the story of a perfect church. It's, it's not the story of a clever church. It is a story about the power of God. In Acts chapter 1, we find ourselves, and we're 40 days after Easter. Jesus has been with his apostles the whole time and uh, proving that he was truly alive, which just blows my mind. I mean, just think about that. He was with them for 40 days, still giving them proof like, y'all, listen. It really is me. Can you just feel Jesus being exasperated of just like, dude, it's been three weeks. You know, it's been seven. It's been five weeks. It's been six weeks. What do you mean you're still wondering? But in Matthew chapter 28, um, right before Jesus ascended, Matthew throws in this little thing, you know, that Jesus is there. He's about to ascend. But then Matthew says of the disciples, but yet some of them still doubted. Like he's like got a cloud around his feet and it's about to take him up into heaven. And there's a guy going, I don't know, man. I don't know. You know, and that's where they are. You know, and so Jesus for these 40 days has been teaching them about the kingdom of God, laying these things out, proving to them that he really is who he, he really is alive. And so as he's about to return to heaven, the disciples gather around him. And this is what it says. It says, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. But, but you, but, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Lord, is it now? Is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Uh, you know, those of you who got kids and you know, you do a road trip now. I mean, your kids are probably like my kids were whenever we would get out of the driveway, you know. You know, for, for 16 years, we've made road trips back to Missouri, where we're from. And, and you know, whenever the kids were, were little, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be, you know, we'd be like on Broadnax Mill. And they'd be like, so how much longer? You know, how, how much longer we got? You know, and it's like, Dad, can you turn on the Wi-Fi? Can you turn the Wi-Fi on? You know, it's like, you don't even know. Whenever I was growing up, I had to count hawks, you know. So you leave me alone when it comes to this Wi-Fi thing. So anyway, um, you know, and so that's kind of where we find the disciples right now, though. They're like, is it now? Is it now? Is it now? Is it is now the time, you know, that you're going to return the kingdom to Israel? Because you got to remember, that's why they signed up with Jesus. I mean, they were like, is it now that you're going to kick the Romans out? Because that was the thing that they were looking for. I mean, they joined this merry band of disciples because they were looking forward to that day whenever Jesus, the Messiah, was going to usher in the kingdom of God, which to them meant he's going to return things back to the way they used to be. You know, they're looking for the glory days. I mean, they're singing Bruce Springsteen, you know. You know, glory days. That's what they want. They want to return to the glory days. Whenever we've got our own king, whenever we're in charge of ourselves, is it now that you're going to do that? Because the thing that they didn't expect, I mean, that's what they wanted the Messiah to do. But what they didn't expect was a violent, brutal, bloody death. And so whenever Jesus was betrayed and executed and crucified, it was like, oh, no. We hitched our horse to the wrong wagon. We picked the wrong team. We, we, we're on the wrong side of this. But then, three days later, he's alive again. And they're like, oh, wait, wait a second. You know, maybe there's something here now. And so here he is about to ascend up into heaven. Like, so is it now? Is it now? Is it now? And you want to know what Jesus' answer is to, you, to them? He says, it's none yet. None yet. Yeah, it's none your business. You know, it's none your business. It's not your business to know if it's now. You don't need to know the times and the dates. You don't need to know what my father has said there. That's not the point here. You, you still have work to do. 
I got something for you to do. And so to begin that work, here's the thing. I'm going to give you power. That's Holy Spirit power. And you're going to go out and you're going to be my witnesses. And you're going to start in your hometown. And then you're going to work your way on out. Okay? That's where you're going to do. You will receive power. Power. So let's call our first witness forward today and let's talk about the Holy Spirit because the way that this, 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 these just couple verses uh, lay out, it's all about the power, the purpose, and the plan. All right? So let's talk about the power. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit is about power. So the Holy Spirit is part of the, the Godhead, part of the Trinity. That God is three in one, but yet he is one and it's three. People ask me all the time, can you explain to me how the Trinity works? And you want to know my answer? No. I can't. Because it is a mystery. I mean, yeah, we can give out analogies and we can give out clover, we can give out water, we can give out eggs, we can do all those other kind of things. But, but listen, at the bottom line is this. The idea of the Trinity, that God is somehow three in one, is a mystery. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay going, you know what? I just don't, I don't fully comprehend this. Because I love what Augustine said. He said this, if you can comprehend it, it's not God. That if you can actually get your arms all the way around something, it's probably not God himself. Because just think about this. If he is the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-existing God, if I can fit him into a little box, guess what? He's not the God of the box. He's bigger than any box we can throw him into. And so I'm perfectly fine going, I don't understand how the three-in-one thing works. I'm perfectly fine saying that. Um, I, I do know this, that the Holy Spirit makes some of us uncomfortable. You know, because um, he's kind of like that family member at the reunion everybody's got to keep an eye on. How many of you all know people like that? You know, the family member at the reunion you've got to keep an eye on because you just don't know what they're going to do. Okay? That's the Holy Spirit. If you don't know that family member, it may be... You, that everybody's keeping an eye on, right? But that's the Holy Spirit. You know, you just don't know exactly what he's going to do, you know? And so we get a little uncomfortable with it. And so sometimes, a lot of times as church folks, it's like we would be more comfortable if the Trinity was, you know, you know, God the Father and then the Son and then the Holy Bible. It's like, okay, that feels a little like a safer Trinity. But it's no, it's God. It's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We can't ignore the Holy Spirit. He is the central figure in the book of Acts. Luke is in love with the Holy Spirit. Fifteen times in his gospel, he mentions the Holy Spirit. Fifty-five times in the book of Acts, he references the Holy Spirit and what he is up to. For reference sake, Gospel of Mark, only six. Gospel of Matthew, only twelve. Luke is enamored with the Holy Spirit. And so the key to understanding the Holy Spirit is just this. He does what he wants, where he wants, and how he wants to do it. He does what he wants, where he wants, when he wants, how he wants to do it. It's what he does. He cannot be put into your theological, doctrinal little box tied up nice and neat with a little bow. He is like the wind. I think I read that somewhere. Oh, yeah, it was Jesus. You know, Jesus says in John chapter 3, you know, the spirit is like the wind. You don't know where it begins. You don't know where it ends. You don't know know where it's coming from. You You just don't know. In fact, here's what I would say. We cannot predict what the Spirit is going to do. We can only trace where the Spirit has been. We can't predict what he's going to do. We can only trace where he is, has been. Alfred Nobel was a Swedish chemist, and he discovered this powerful substance, and he, he needed a name for it. And so he, he called his, his friend, who was a Greek scholar. He's like, what's the, the Greek word for power? And he's like, well, it's dunamis, and it's spelled D-Y-N-A-M-I-S is how we would, you know, uh, transliterate it. It's power, dunamis, which is where we get our word dynamite, okay? So Alfred Nobel develops dynamite, and whenever Luke comes along and he's describing the Holy Spirit and he says, Jesus says, you will receive power, he's saying, you will receive dynamite, okay? Boom, you're going to be filled with just, you're going to be a powder, powder keg. And whenever the Holy Spirit shows up, boom, stuff happens, okay? I I grew up in Carthage, Missouri, and in in Carthage, Missouri, um, there's one of 12 plants in the United States um, that actually manufactures dynamite. It's a company called Dino Nobel, okay? And years ago, 
Uh, it's actually happened multiple times over the decades. But there would be like somebody would be on a smoke break or something else like that, which is not a great idea at a dynamite plant um, because it caused the entire thing to blow up. Okay. Now, my grandma and grandpa Gibson's house is about 12, 14 miles away from the plant. It moved grandma and grandpa's house off the foundation by several inches. The courthouse in downtown Carthage, which is about seven miles away from the plant, had the windows blown out of the courthouse. See, here's the thing about dynamite. Nobody ever goes, so was dynamite here? It's like, was that dynamite that did that? It's like, no, it's pretty obvious that dynamite did something here. And it is the same with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit shows up, it's like, boom, something happened. And nobody has to go, was that the Holy Spirit? It's like, I'm pretty clear, pretty sure that that was the power of God showing up. You know when the Holy Spirit has shown up. He says, you will receive power. Now, why, why is God going to give them the power of the Holy Spirit? What is the purpose of it? Well, it is to do whatever is necessary to promote Jesus. That's the whole purpose of the power of the Spirit. Now, in the book of Acts, here's what it looks like. They do exorcisms. They do healings. Um, they have divine escapes through the power of the Spirit. But you want to know the number one way that the Spirit shows up? It's when somebody tells someone else about Jesus. 76% of the time that the Spirit shows up, it is the Spirit empowering someone to verbally tell somebody else about Jesus and what he has done. Now, here's the good news for you this morning. You guys ready for this? In Christ, Christian, if you are a Christian, you have the same power living inside of you. You walk around like a powder keg ready to explode at any moment and just to boom to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to allow you to share with somebody else what exactly Jesus has done in your life. He has given you this power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And this spirit is what allows us and helps us to fulfill our purpose. That, that's the next thing. In the book of Acts, the word witnesses shows up 29 times. You will be my, my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. And a witness is just somebody who says, I know this to be true, so I will be loyal to the truth. I, I'm going to be a witness. Uh, the witness, um, no, another way to think of witness is the word martyr. Okay, You guys are familiar with the mo word martyr? You know, somebody who who loses their life for a belief? Well, the word martyr is the Greek word here that Luke uses for witnesses. So literally, you could say, you will be my martyrs. You will give testimony. You will be loyal no matter the cost. And that's what the power of the Spirit is for. It's to empower witnesses. To Jesus' name. And that's exactly what we see in the book of Acts. Peter, James, John, Stephen, and Paul. They all give testimony. They are very chatty. So I've got a friend and a mentor that says the Holy Spirit is the most feminine of the Godhead. Because all he wants to do is talk. Okay? He's very chatty. Oh, come on now. That's good. That's funny. He's very, very chatty. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He, he wants to help us speak and to be witness. And that's what these people do. It's like, hey, Jesus changed our lives. And so we have to be witnesses. How can we not say anything about what Jesus has done for me? I can't help but speak of the great things that the Lord has done in my life. And as Christians, we have the exact same purpose. To give testimony, to make much of Jesus, to promote him, to testify what he has done in your life. To testify to this and to share with any people that you can. This is what God has done in us. To make you chatty. 
about the things that the Lord is doing and has done in your life. So every post, every conversation, every purchase, every performance review, every assignment you complete, every lap you run in practice is an opportunity for you to testify. To give witness to what Jesus has done in your life. People should see, hear, and experience Jesus by interacting with us. And so if you are looking for purpose in life, you want to know what I think is missing right now in so many lives? Purpose. You feel aimless. You feel directionless. You don't know what you want to do or anything. You're looking for purpose and meaning is what you're looking for. Well, here's the good news. If you're a Christian, you have a God-ordained purpose already. It's already stamped onto your life. You have a job to do. You have a purpose in your life. You have a God-given, God-commanded purpose. Be his witness wherever you find yourself. And testify to what he has done in your life. I love what the preacher Gordon MacDonald says. He says this, without a mission... People live by reaction rather than initiation. You have an initiative already in your life if you're a Christian. It is to be his witness. You have a power that has been given to you. The Spirit is going to empower you to complete the purpose. And the Spirit is going to help all of us execute the plan. There is a game plan laid out here in verse 8. Now, I loved it whenever I was playing uh, college basketball, um, and Coach Williams would come in and say, okay, so here's the game plan. Here's how we're going to win tonight. Here's how we're going we're gonna to take down dirty Manhattan Christian College. You know, this is how we're going to take them down, because even Christian colleges have rivals, you know, kind of thing. And so, um, but he, here's the game plan. Adam, you're going to guard their best guard, and your job is don't let them score. Got it. Joe, who's about six foot two and had really sharp elbows, he's like, you're going to guard their best forward. Don't let him score. Got it. Then you look at Steve, our six foot five, all American. He's like, and Steve, you're going to score 50 points tonight and we're going to win the game. You know, it's like, all right, we got a game plan here. You know, we can execute this. And so I loved it whenever coach would come in with a game plan. Here's the plan. Here's the plan. Here's how we're going to do it. And, you know, we all, we like having a plan. And that's exactly what Jesus does here. He lays out a plan for us to execute. He says, look, there's work to be done. There's work to be done. You start here in Jerusalem, which is your hometown, and then you move out to Judea, which is like your community, your your bigger area there, and then you're going to go to Samaria, which is like the pagan pig dogs that you hate. Okay, You go to people you don't even like, and then I want you to go all the way to the ends of the earth. Not just sit around and wait, but get up and move. There's work to be done. Don't just sit around and wait for people to come to you. You get up and you go do something. But here's what I want you to see. Where does the plan begin? In Jerusalem, which is another way of saying it begins at home. It begins at home. That's why I think it's very appropriate that on Mother's Day, we're talking about a plan of attack of how we can be witnesses. Because where does this all begin? It begins at home. Your your first ministry, your first calling, is to the people that live under your roof. Those are the people that you are to disciple. Those are the people you are to model faithfulness. And you start at home, and then you begin working outward. You start in the, the, the place to where you have the most influence. I love this quote. It's unknown. I don't know who said it, so, um, but you can't give credit to me because I'm telling you it's from unknown. Um, unknown has a lot of great quotes, by the way. Um, I, we need to find him. Um, but anyway, uh, he said, The light that shines the farthest will shine brightest at home. The light that shines the farthest will shine brightest at home. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, just, just listen up. Start early with your kids, teaching them about who Jesus is, the plan that he has for their lives, and start teaching them at the beginning. Now, if you're like, I came to faith later, it's too late. No, it's not too late. 
You begin where you are, and you take your 15-year-old, you take your 18-year-old, you take your 23-year-old, you take your 30-year-old, and you say, hey, I just want you to know that the Lord has done something incredible in my life, and it's completely altered the way that I view everything. And maybe, here, here's something that just occurs to me, maybe, maybe one of the things for you, maybe you've come to faith later, maybe, maybe you, you take your adult child and you pull them aside and just say, hey, I need to apologize to you. Because I did not teach you from the days of infancy the things of God, and I'm just really sorry, but I have now come to the place to where I realize what the Lord has done, and I want you to know what he means to me. Because what are you doing then? You are being a witness. You are testifying to the good work that God has done in your life. There's a plan. It starts at home. It starts at home. And then as you continue to raise your kids, grandmas and grandpas, listen, your, your job's not done. You continue to teach and continue to model faithfulness and generosity and goodness, moral character, following Jesus. You continue to do those things. It starts at home, and then we start to work out. Then we start to work at the job place. Then we start to testify at the ball field. Then we start to testify. We're testifying at school. We're testifying wherever we find ourselves. And then we start going on mission trips, and we start going to the ends of the earth. Then maybe you start going to people you don't like, all right? Maybe that's something you need to think about as well. As you start testifying, because we have been called to be his witnesses. He gives us a power. He gives us purpose. And he gave us a plan. In fact, bottom line is this. You have been given power to accomplish God's purpose and plan. You've been given that. So tap into it. And be his witness wherever you find yourself. So here's my challenge for you this morning. It's just a question. Who needs to hear your story? Who needs to hear your story? I want you to think back over your life and what is just like one area, one facet, one time in your life whenever you can look back and the only thing that you can say is that had to be Jesus. It's not because I was smart enough, good enough, good looking enough, any of those kind of things. No, no, no. This had to be Jesus. Jesus is the one who stepped in and made a difference in my life. You know, maybe it is he healed you of your cancer. Uh, maybe it was his presence with you through the loss of a spouse or the loss of a child. Uh, maybe it was the way he healed your marriage after infidelity that you committed or that they committed and your marriage was brought together. Maybe it is overcoming an addiction. What is it in your life that you can look at and say, it was Jesus. That's the only thing that makes sense. That the power of the Spirit just threw, that he just did something incredible in my life. Who needs to hear your story? Who is it in your Jerusalem, in your Judea, in your Samaria, at the ends of the earth, who needs to hear about what Jesus has done in your life? You've been called to be a witness to his great works, to be loyal to him, to say, I know this to be true. Jesus changed my life. Testify to it. This is why I love our baptism videos. I love them. And, and a lot of times we get people, you know, they're just like, I just don't feel comfortable doing it. Do I really have to do it? Is it a requirement? And we're like, no, it's not a requirement. But doggone it, we really want you to do it. You know, I'm not telling you I'm not going to throw you under the water and those kind of things. You know, but it's like, we really want you to do it. And here's why we want people to do it. And this is what we tell people. Because who knows by telling your story who is going to be sitting out in the crowd or who's going to be watching online, who hears your story and goes, that sounds like my story. And if God could do that in them, maybe, just maybe, he could do that in me. Who needs to hear your story? We're called to be his witnesses, to be chatty Cathy's about the great work that he has done in our lives power, purpose, and a plan. But here's the deal. It's not just what he wants to do through us. It's what he wants to do in us. See, the Holy Spirit is leading. He's guiding, convicting, calling, empowering, comforting. He's leading us into truth. And the truth is 
that the Spirit of God wants to reveal God's power, purpose, and plan in your life. And here's the good news. The Holy Spirit can be in you through faith in Jesus Christ, the one who gave himself to you. But the question is, will you give yourself to him? Because here's the thing, we're all sinners. We are all people in need of forgiveness, and his death provides that. We've all got things that we need to change. We've got all got things that we need to repent of, that we need to apologize for. But maybe today, which is a great day, by the way, because this is the day that the Lord has made. We can rejoice and be glad in it because there's never been a day like today. It's a special day. So it's, since it's a special day, it's a great day to make a decision. It's a great day to say, you know what, God, I need you. I, I am asking you to change me, to wash me, to make me new, to confess your need, to confess your desire for forgiveness, to, to say, I want to be united with Christ, and I want to experience the blessing of baptism. Maybe that's a decision you need to make today. It's a great day to do it. And so if you're, you're watching with us online, and that's a, a, something you're wrestling with, and you're ready to make that call, uh, I want to invite you to head over to our website, fill out that quick form. We'll be in touch with you this week about what your next steps are. But maybe you're here in the room and you're like, you know what? I know that this is what the Lord is calling me to do. Well, then here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pray over us. And then after I pray, the service is going to be over. Um, But your chance to respond is not. I'll be standing right here in front of the stage and would love nothing more than to pray with you and to talk with you about how you can have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. So, Heavenly Father, today we're asking for your help, that you would guide us, that you would open our eyes to see what you are trying to do in us and through us. And as a church, Father, help us to never grow satisfied, to never utter those words, mission accomplished, because until we are with you completely, the job's never done. So help us to continue to strive and to strain and to push forward and to be your witnesses testify to the great work that you have done in us and around us. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.